Okay, we're rolling now. Okay. These little anchorites wouldn't be so bad in the summertime, maybe, or in the fall or the spring, but in the winter, they'd be really wicked, wouldn't they, without the fireplace or something? <laughs> yes. And in the summer, they'd be beastly hot. But, okay, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at Christine Carpenter. And they aren't sure exactly when she was born, but it was around 1316. Hmm. And in, in 1329, she submitted a petition because, you know, as we talked before, if you wanted to be an anchorite, you had to petition the bishop because he was the one that gave you permission. Um, and if you can't see the whole screen there, you can either move it over or go to a different video style. Uh, where where our pictures are in a different place, you can move that around. Just move it, and then the people show up. <laughs> yeah, just put put your cursor up in that top bar, and you and hold the the um, mouse down or the pad down, and you can drag it so that you can get that whole picture that's in the upper right hand corner if you can't see it. Anyway, Christine Carpenter. I mean, she sounds really you know, that's a modern name, but she wasn't. So she submitted this petition to the bishop in 1329, and she became the anchoress in Shear, England. And Shear was her home, so she didn't go anywhere else. She just stayed right in the, in the same town she was living in. In fact, the cottages where her family lived are still there today. So if you ever get a chance to go to Shear, England, you can see where Christine Carpenter uh, was raised or where she was born. Um, she was granted permission, so she was put into an anchorage, an anchorite area, an anchor, and um, she received her food and drink through a metal grating on the outside wall, which is like that picture that was on the green background. There was a, on the outside wall, she could, um, you know, have, have access to um, outside people. How and old was she when she got accepted? How, say it again, how old what? How old was she when she got accepted to the DNA grade? Well, they think she was born around um, 1316. So she was in her, in her teens, you know. Yeah, um, she was a kid, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. 23, no, 13? Am I subtracting wrong? 13, yeah, she was very young. <laughs> um, and that, that was kind of gonna be, <laughs> create, maybe that's what created problems later, which I'll tell you about in a second here. Um, so she got food and drink through a metal grating on the outside wall and, and she had contact with people at least that way. And every three months she would have her hair cut. How we know that? I don't know, but they've found, they've found evidence that this, this was one of the things that, that she was allowed to have done. Now those pictures, the white pictures there to the right of her name, in the wall, um, of in the interior of the church between the church and the the anchorite uh, hold the anchor hold there was a quatrefoil which you can see that's a an even armed cross quatra is four so there's four arms you can see it on the left hand side everybody see that mm -hmm. yes 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 yep. um and she could receive the eucharist through that because there's you can see there's a large enough opening to have a hand come through and there were, the thing to the right is called a squint because um, you, there's an opening, there's a, a large square, but then the thing on the left, which faces into the church, that's that kind of gray rectangle, vertical rectangle, is actually a passage, a hole, um, a narrow slit that faced the altar. So she could look through that squint, which I think that's an appropriate name. Uh, to pray with with people in, in at mass, or she could um, reflect by gazing on the crucifix or the tabernacle or what was going on on the altar. So, not not every anchor hold had a quatrefoil and a squint, both, but all of them had something where um, the anchorite could look into the church. But generally, it was set up this way where nobody could see in. They could see out, but you could not see in because that would be too much distraction. If you go to Shear in the church today, 
the quatrefoil and the, the squint are still visible. You can still find them. Now, I think this is where it comes in that she was so young because it was, if she changed her mind, if any of the anchorites changed their mind, it was equal to excommunication and that meant everlasting hell. Because remember when the bishop uh, would come and bless them, um, sometimes depending on the bishop, they would say the office of the dead because the anchorite was becoming dead to the world. And then sometimes when they were walled in, um, they were walled in with concrete, you know, with a mason would come and wall them in and the bishop would put the seal, his ring uh, on that wet stone or wet concrete rather so that um, you couldn't, just couldn't get out. Um, however, she, and be, so before you go in, you really want to, the bishop really wanted to make sure this person knew what they were getting into. So she was questioned, her family was questioned, all of her friends were questioned. It's kind of, it reminds me kind of like of when somebody wants to join the FBI, they talk to everybody and anybody that has had any connection with a person. So that's what the bishop and his, I'm sure his uh, helpers did. They talked to everybody and they were examined thoroughly. They were concerned about her virtue, of course, and her chastity. Um, occasionally a widow would be allowed to become an anchorite, uh, but if you were not chaste, you were not allowed in. So sometime between 1329, when she went into this anchor hold and 1332, which was three years, so then she would have been 16, she changed her mind and she left her cell. Now, I don't know how she got out there. I, from what I can remember, there was, um, and I'll show you in a minute here, there was a door. There was a door into the church that people could, um, you know, someone could come in and cut her hair or, she, or whatever. Uh, this often happened in cloistered um, convents also. They had doors, but then they would have, I don't remember what they were called, but they would have wheels built into the door so that on one side, if you were inside the convent, you could put uh, requests on a, a tray and then spin it around to the outside. Somebody on the outside could bring something, a gift or whatever, put it on the outside of the tray and spin it so that it would come to the inside of the convent, the cloister, cloistered nuns, but nobody saw anyone. So um, there was a door in her anchor hold um, I don't know, it doesn't look like from what I could tell there was anything like this spinning tray, but she did decide to leave. She left. Not a good thing. <laughs> uh, the next year she decided that wasn't such a good idea. And so she wrote a letter and the letter had to go to the Pope, not just the Bishop. She wrote a letter to the Pope in 1333 and she requested to be re-enclosed. And the letter, and I'll quote you a little bit of it, it must have been written not by her. I don't think she was literate at all. Um, it was probably written by somebody that could read or write because of the way it was, it was uh, written. And it requested a re her return, quote, lest by wandering any longer about the world, she be exposed to the bites of the rapacious wolf, unquote. <laughs> Fancy schmancy way of saying if she comes out, you know, if she stays in the world, she's going to sin terribly. Let's get her back in. And it went on to say, if she behaved herself from then on, she would be granted a penance in proportion to her sin, was the answer that came back. A penance in proportion to her sin. If, however, she neglects to come to you, if she neglects to come back to the church, henceforth she shall lapse into the sentence of excommunication. So if she decided to lapse again, or if she decided not to go back, she would be excommunicated. Um, she did return and thus she was saved from the eternal damnation and the fires of hell. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that would, apparently for her, that was enough of a threat. And I'm sure for many people in those years, uh, the threat of excommunication was absolutely terrifying because it guaranteed that you were going to go to hell. 
Um, the Pope did excommunicate some interesting people along the years. One was Galileo. And it wasn't until, I think it was John the 23rd, um, Galileo was reinstated and could get out of wherever he was and go to heaven. <laughs> now, I like, I like to think of, of God standing at the gate and saying to Galileo, um, I think they made a mistake this time <laughs> and telling him to come on in. Uh, so she returned and it may be that at that time, and I don't know, but that, that the only doorway out of her anchor hold was walled up. It was replaced with a solid wall because there is a spot where there was a door and it is now a solid wall. Um, we really don't know when she died, but it was sometime after 1332, 1333, um, probably after 1333 easily, because that's when her letter went out to the Pope and things were pretty slow in those years. We have no idea how long she stayed in the anchor hold. Uh, and the usual practice, I think I mentioned last week, was to bury anchorites where they lived. And so her cell would have been opened and a grave dug under her cell. Or she might be buried in the churchyard as Wolfric was. In fact, remember Wolfric? He was, <laughs> he was dug up a couple of times because the parish priest um, was given such a hassle by the parishioners because one group, the monks wanted him and then the parish people wanted him and the monks wanted him. So he dug Wolfric up and buried him someplace and didn't tell anybody where. Um, so Christine Carpenter, we have no idea. Julian is buried in her churchyard, but again, you know, things have been, have happened. And so we're not exactly sure where. So the cell itself, as you can see in that picture, it says site of the cell of Christine Carpenter, Anchorage of Shear, 1329. Um, the cell itself is gone. The church is there and the, the inside, the church wall against which her, the anchor hold was built um, is still there, but the, the outside cell that was built on is no longer there any longer. What do you want to know about Christine Carpenter? There isn't too much to tell you about her. This is really, I mean, I really hope to spend more time with her, but I couldn't find any more information. Well, this week I was thinking about what happens if they change their mind. <laughs> there you and go. How you answered it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I know when I was a kid and when Vatican II came along, there were a number of religious that left convents and left monasteries. And there was a great outcry from the church, but no one that I'm aware of was threatened with excommunication. Oh, one of our, uh, one of my CCD teachers when I was in high school had left the convent and she was a full member of our church, but uh, she had been a nun. Yes. Yeah, there are a number of, well, Kathleen Sapelka, who was principal over at Catholic Memorial, was a nun. Um, I've known a number of nuns. And if, priests, they, they say, once a priest, always a priest. You can withdraw from the priesthood, but you can never undo the anointing. Um, so there are priests that left and um, got married, some of them. Some of them joined other denominations. Uh, it was quite a quite a thing it, it makes you wonder what what kept them together in the monastery or in the convent when you know before vatican ii if they were if so many of them were i don't want I, and i don't know how long it took I, I hate to say quick to leave once the opportunity presented itself but it didn't hold the um the stigma i guess that it had in the past so my sister left after 18 years, just after Vatican II. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> Were Anchorites other religions besides Catholic? And was Catherine Catholic? Everybody was Catholic at that point. This, oh. These were all pre-Reformation, pre-Martin Luther. So up to this point, um, everybody was, well, they were all Christian, you know, at, because everybody was the same. If you belong to a Christian church, you belong to the Christian church. 
Um, yes, there are other anchorites. Um, in fact, that's, that's uh, a much more contemporary one, but she's also Catholic, uh, I believe. I better look her up, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, next week we're gonna be talking about one. But yeah, there were others. There were um, men that went into the desert in Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. and there, there are still some there today that are Coptic Christians. So now I don't know, Pat Knuth, you probably know, are Coptic Christians considered under the umbrella of Catholicism? Yes. Yes, they are, because we used to have our liturgical minister with a cop with Coptic. Okay, that's he, what I thought. He, that's what I yeah. thought. A lot, of the, a lot of the Orthodox sects are um, considered, you know, uh, in communion with, with Rome. Not all of them, but a number of them. So, yeah, so there are still um, people out there today, but the ancient desert fathers um, weren't, they were more like hermits uh, than, than anchorites, but it was, you know, it's pretty close because you're out there in the desert. There's no connection with with, I hate to say civilization, there's no connection with the outside world so much, the secular world. Okay, now, I guess, did they take some sort of oath, you know, like a priest or a nun might? Anchorites, yes. Or anchorites, yes. Yes, yes, they promised um, a fealty to the bishop. So they only had to answer to the bishop, but they did have to answer to the bishop. So, but before they went in, and it, now if you wanna join um, a Carmelite that's um, cloistered, they, they are very careful about, um, do you really want this? Are you sure? They go into all sorts of questions and there's, there's times where you spend time with them and then go home and then, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a process and I suspect that anchorites were similar um, and, and, and Christine left and then was able to go back. So apparently uh, her letter of apology and humility was enough that the Pope said, yes, I think the second time you really are sincere about, about staying. So it's like a novitiate where you take, uh, take final vows I'm not sure about anchorites. I uh, I don't know that there were vows, you know, various stages of vows. Well, that's why I wondered how they could be excommunicated. What was you? What was criteria for excommunicating them? Very easy. You walk out of the cell and you leave. You go back to the world, and you're you're breaking your vow that you made with the bishop to say that you were going to remain an anchorite for the remainder of your days. And I, I, as far as I know, that's the only vow that was made was uh, to promise, you know, make a promise to the bishop to um, obey him and to never leave. And that's, I mean, that's enough. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a major, major step to say the least, I think. Okay, so I, did I understand you to say that Vatican II changed that? That's when it changed where you were no longer excommunicated? I don't, the, honestly, I don't know because anchorites dwindled away um, after a couple hundred years. They're still around, but I think now they're more they're more connected to a monastery. Mm -hmm. um, the two the two contemporary contemporary ones um, that I did some some research on are both connected to a monastery, and so they are first beholding to the abbot. Um, or the abbess that, that leads that particular convent or monastery. And, but then those people are also under the aegis of the Pope because uh, like Mother Teresa started her own um, missionaries of charity. She had to go and petition the Pope to start that order of nuns. And uh, yeah. that's not a cloistered order, but you know, so there, there's, a, there's a sequence of hierarchy that, that these people have to, are beholding to. Okay, I'm reading a book about Mother Teresa. Yeah. And it took her a long, long, long time and a lot of pleading to get that, uh, that order she wanted. Yes, yes, because she already belonged to an order. It's like, why do you want to start another one? You know, but she was called to do that. Um, and it certainly, it, it's grown and it uh, ministers to the very poorest of the poor uh, exclusively. So 
it was a, it was certainly a, a needed ministry. So, but the the anchorites didn't have a ministry as like that. They were available for counseling, and many of them uh, became known as very holy people and and giving out really good advice and helping people grow spiritually. So they they were holy women. Um, sometimes I wonder with with Christine at, at 13 years old. Of course, at 13, a lot of those girls were getting married also. That was because in those years, that was so early on. You know, maybe she thought it would be an escape. Maybe she thought it would give her um, not power exactly, but allow her to be her, her own person. Control. And, and, then uh -huh. once, and then once she got in there, decided that, oh, this is much more difficult than I anticipated. Hard telling at this distance. And you weren't able to find any of her writings? Nothing. Or... I don't think she could write. Okay. The letter that was sent to the Pope is in third person. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it so... says she will do this and she will do that rather than I will do this and I will do that. So I don't think she was literate at all. Julian was literate. Right. Julian of Norwich, because her writings are available. So you wonder um, if she had anyone coming up to her cell to ask for advice or prayers or whatever, being that she didn't have much well, written about, you know? You know, there's street smarts and there's book smarts. And she wouldn't, yeah, have, you, you know, she, I don't think she would have lasted her whole life if she hadn't grown in the depth of her spirituality and expanded her horizons spiritually. And that's really what people were looking for. Plus, very, very few people in these years could read or write. Okay. This, you know, very, very few. Um, this is pre-printing press. That didn't come in until around the time of Martin Luther, which is part of the reason Martin Luther became so wildly popular so quickly, because he printed Bibles. And um, because the printing press had, had been invented fairly close to his time. But in this time with Christine, with Wolfric, Wolfric was doing, if you remember, Wolfric was doing, um, he was a scribe and so he was copying holy books. Uh, so all of those book of, books of the hours and prayer books and such were all written only by monks because they were the only people that could, could read and write. So, and it cost a lot of money. And if you were a nobleman and you had been trained to read, you'd have to pay a, a hefty sum to get a, a prayer book printed for you. And it would take a year um, to have something printed up. So, you know, things moved much more slowly as far as writing and reading was concerned. But people can really be, um, can be, really holy and have depth of feeling without having a lot of skills. I mean, if you think of people um, even now that are blind, sometimes they're discriminated against because people don't think they're very smart. Um, I saw something the other day, a special of an architect who was a, a regular sighted architect and then he went blind over something. I don't remember what it was, macular degeneration perhaps. And he taught himself to do architectural drawings in braille and i mean it's just amazing just wow. amazing so um people can adapt it's just it's wonderful so but i wanted you to show you here on this next one which is actually the last slide but there is her church there's her church this is where her cell was and there's the doorway that they bricked up. And I, they think that that was bricked up at the time that she returned um, after she had you know, left and then gotten permission to come back. So there was still a grate uh, on the outside for food to come in. There was still that quatrefoil for Eucharist and the squint so she could see into the church, but there was no longer a door. Now, they don't know for sure when the door was put in, but that's the speculation. Interesting. And many of I think it's so amazing that she was like 13. Yeah. And well, then the 32. 
I mean, 16 and 16 is 32. <laughs> she was 16 years old. Yeah, she was yeah, 13 the first time she went in, 16 when she returned. Um, and that was in, you know, 1332. And then sometime after that, we don't know when she died. She could have been there another 20 years yet. Mm. Um, many times the anchorites lived long lives because they were well taken care of. They didn't have um, the pressures of the outside world. People fed them. They could spend their time in, I mean, like we, like we spend our time, you know. Um, well, and they didn't get uh, infections because they weren't around other people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So when the Black Plague oh, went through, right. they didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bathroom type facilities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's how do you keep yourself occupied, you know? And how do you keep yourself clean? Well, yes, that wasn't a big issue in those years anyway. <laughs> um, the King of England in, gosh, what would have that have been? In the 1600s, that's 300 years after this, took a bath twice in his life, twice. Once when he was born and once uh, when he was going to be crowned king. That was it. So Whoa. that's, that, yeah, I know. That's why people carried um, nosegays. Um, although, you know, if you're around a certain smell, you habituate to it after a while. I know I've, I spent some time uh, teaching in the Czech Republic and, and at one point, a bunch of people and I, two, two teachers and a van full of people, Czech people, wonderful, wonderful people went to one of these spas and we piled into this van and a lot of Europeans do not believe in opening car windows, especially Eastern Europeans. We're gonna get a sore neck. It's gonna, you know, we're gonna get a stiff neck. We're not gonna open any of the windows. So here we, and it's summer. Well, use your imagination, you know, um, very little deodorant they had, you know, they don't, they didn't at the time, things have changed over the years too. This was a number of years ago didn't bathe every day, maybe once a week, once every couple of weeks. And so as we we're going along, I had to breathe through my mouth and close off my nose, you know, <laughs> because, and it, and that was just fine that for, because they were used to that. And if I were around enough, I'd get used to that too. So I, I think that's she, how, what did, what was she doing to get dirty other than sweating? You know, they didn't, they weren't out working in the fields and all of that. So Sweat was a good, clean, holy smell. <laughs> fragrance, mm -hmm. pardon me, fragrance. <laughs> Aroma. <laughs> Aroma, I like that. <clears throat> so, yeah, there are all sorts of considerations when you think about it. Um, but they lived very, very simple lives and they wanted to pray. They wanted to um, get themselves like some of them flagellated themselves. They would beat with a willow stick on their back. They did, they eat, they ate very little. Um, they spent time in contemplation, meditation, prayer, listening uh, for God's voice. That was, and then talking, you know, with people that came to, to, to them for advice or for blessings. Um, some of them uh, effect, like Wolfric, was said to um, have miracles. He could heal people. So, you know, why not? Let's go see, you know, grandma's not feeling real well. She's got this, this open sore on her arm. Let's, let's take her over to Wolfric's and see, see what he can do for her. So they, they were kept busy. In fact, I think, I don't know if it was Julian, one of them was complaining that they didn't have time for themselves because they were being bothered all the time. And I think that was Julian. And so uh, the Bishop restricted the hours that she could talk to people <laughs> so she could spend more time in prayer. So um, before we stop, you might want to go to YouTube and search for the last anchorite, the last anchorite. Um, and I'll say it again in a minute. Uh, go to YouTube and in the search bar, put in the last anchorite. What should come up, and it has every time I've looked, is a, a man who is a Coptic Christian 
He has a big, long gray beard down to about here and a black hat. And he's dressed in black robes. And he's, um, you see his, a little bit of his torso like you're seeing us. And he originally was from Australia. And he is an anchorite in Egypt today. Uh, this, the video it actually is a documentary. And so it's kind of long, but you can fast forward. And he does talk at one point about what it's like to be an anchorite because he considers himself not just a hermit, but an anchorite. He, he uh, has spent some of his time in a cave, but he is an English speaker and he does not speak fluent Arabic and no one else speaks English. So he cannot communicate with, with his fellow monks. So even though he's living in a monastery with, with other monks, he um, is somewhat isolated because none of them know his language. And um, he does, he's been there a number of years, so he knows enough Arabic now and all, but, it, but it's, it's very interesting. It shows the kind of land he's living in, which would be the same kind of land the Desert Fathers were living in and what the monastery looks like. It's quite a, a, a complex there. Um, and he's interviewed, very interesting. So YouTube, the last anchorite. Okay, we're early, but that's okay, I hope. Got any other comments or questions for us? Once again, who's next week? Next week is a woman known uh, as Nazarena of Jesus. Nazarena of Jesus. She was, uh, that, she was um, an American. And so she had a regular American name, but then when she joined um, and became an anchorite, she took the name Nazarena of Jesus. So we'll talk about her next week. Is she the more modern one you mentioned yes. last week? Okay. Yes. Well, she, she's American. Yeah, she's got yes. it. <laughs> yeah. She was born in 1907 and died in 1990. So she's very contemporary. And 1990, that was like yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, some of us, it was. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, we're talking 30 years ago. Um, but the, the man, the last anchorite, if you go to look at that, um, that video is five years old. So that's much more contemporary, even much more modern. So, okay. All right. No other comments, questions? I was looking for some of the writings from Julian. Yes. And it, there's a lot of them out there, but I don't know which ones are the better ones to buy. Um, um, I, let me do some putzing with it and then I can let you know next week because there are some that I found really, really useful. Um, I, okay. I don't have any left because I keep passing things on <laughs> to people I think would be would would like them. So. Even though I was an English teacher and I inhale books, if I had books everywhere, I wouldn't have any place to sleep. I'd well, that's why I do online books so much. Yes. And yeah. a lot of hers are available with a Kindle. Yes. Yes. And yeah. And there are some good ones. Um, yeah. So, but I've learned over the years, I better, you know, purge my collections and give them to people while I'm alive that I know would, would appreciate them. So that's what I've done. Fortunately or unfortunately, sometimes I get books back to uh, not the same ones. I'll say, oh, you'll really like this one. Here, take this one. Said, you want it back or can I pass it on, you know? So, <laughs> okay, Julian, I will do some, some checking on I'd that. I appreciate that, yeah. Sure, and I think Mary is probably going to put this up, this session up on YouTube also. The other two are up there. If you go to, so, um, oh, my off mute, yeah. Um, Catholic Community of Waukesha Formation, um, they will come up if you want to tell anyone else who wants to listen to them. You have to type that all in, Catholic Community of Waukesha Formation. A slash in between there or just? Nothing. Nope. It's, if you just go to YouTube and type that in, just gotcha. as, a, and they're both there. Okay, excellent. And I will upload this one tomorrow. Okay. So. It's just really weird to, to listen to myself talk. Yes. So if you guys have friends or something that would like to listen, um, okay. that's where they are. If you have questions, just email me. Or me. Or, or Marianne. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. There's a closing prayer up there. 
So let's do that. Lord, Lord help us to Lord, always Lord, remember, Lord, remember Lord, that, that you are with us. us. Even when, we, even when we flee from you or from Lord, hardships, bring us back, bring us back to, you. to you so that yes. we may praise you, you forever word in Lord, words Lord, and in deeds. Amen. 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 Well, now we've got time to go and have a glass of wine before dinner or after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. We'll see you next week. Yep. Bye. Next week. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mary, you look so good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you That's feel so nice. good? Do you feel good? Some days I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing what everyone else is doing, right, Suzanne? We're just <laughs> sitting, 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 sitting. <laughs> yep, yep. It's nice seeing you. Nice to see you. You too, Suzanne. I see Suzanne at, uh, uh, at Cup of Joe. Cup of Joe, yep. So that's good. All right, we'll see you next week. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>